Hello! Before we get into this week's episode, I just wanted to give you a little plug for the eLife Ambassadors programme. No, we're not being paid for this, though if eLife are listening, I'd not turn down paid adverts, because we really need to find some way to keep the lights on around here. Anyway, just want to plug this because it's a really great opportunity for early career researchers interested in greater openness, integrity and inclusion in science. If you want to know more, there's a webinar on the 27th of October and the deadline is the 7th of November. Links will be in the show notes, so get applying now. Seriously, pause this, go apply, come back and enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we talked to postdoc Derek Lau about alpha synuclein Parkinson's disease and being a new postdoc during the lockdown. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. It, it's it's really good to get another neuroscience paper on the show. Generally, we found that we pick either immunology papers, it's my background, or we pick neuroscience papers, because that's Emma's background, occasionally throwing in some weird fly etymology stuff because of John. So, you know, this is hopefully something I'm becoming a bit more familiar with. And we're talking about Parkinson's disease today, which is really, really interesting. So I, I've done a little bit of, well, I learned about Parkinson's disease. I'm not an expert. But you are... So hopefully you can tell us a lot about it. Well, thank you for Johnny and or Emma for having me on the show. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, yeah, so um, actually, I guess in my PhD, I wasn't really specialized in Parkinson. Actually, my background was in HIV. And it was the technique that, you know, carried me over to working with Parkinson's um, disease, which is what my supervisors are working on. And uh, for those who that knows, I guess, don't know much about it, I guess, um, brief as I can be, it's a uh, neurodegenerative diseases, um, where, which I guess classically uh, happens to all people as they age. And, and basically, um, the classical symptom is that they have like very uncontrolled hand tremors, and that comes from the death, cell death of um, what you call these uh, dopamine um, neurons. Yeah, and what I guess um, uh, in Parkinson's disease, uh, the other feature is a hallmark feature is like when, when you look at these cells um, with um, patients who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you have these um, inclusions in these cells known as a Lewy body. So when these inclusions are packed with, you know, uh, until recently shown that uh, it has a lot of lipids, but historically, um, people, I mean, I guess the community would thought that it's really enriched in this uh, protein called alpha synuclein in which the function is, I guess, still not very well characterized, but uh, it, it is definitely in there. And, and this protein, when you make it in a test tube and, and try to purify it recombinantly, it makes these fibrils. And these fibrils, you know, like these tangles are actually in this little body. And, and I guess we are onto something. A lot of, you know, I guess the community are onto this little body and alpha synuclein and, and using that as a biomarker essentially um, for the progression of this disease. So could you tell us just a little bit more about what alpha synuclein is? Because the, the, it's primary part of what the preprint is about. Sure. Um, it's a, a very small protein. Basically, it's, it's expressed in, um, in actually quite a lot of cells, to be honest. So, um, but it's mainly found is in these um, dopaminergic neurons. So I guess uh, they, they are responsible in, I guess, like motor movements and whatnot. This is why, I guess, um, when these cells die, you exhibit those, um, those uh, Parkinson-like symptoms, essentially. And I guess normally, I guess this protein is typically unstructured. And in fact, there's, uh, to date, there's no, you know, structural, you know, um, crystallography structures on, on that, on that, that protein per se. And generally appears as monomer. So it doesn't, it just is in those cells. And we, we think they are kind of relevant for, I guess, dopamine release or trafficking. But to be honest, not, it's not so sure. It's, its mechanism is not fully elucidated yet. But what it has known is that um, at some point, I guess, as the individual ages, is this um, uh, monomeric alpha synuclein kind of eventually some trigger, whether it's reactive oxygen species. So basically the environment, some kind of environmental trigger caused them to, you know, assemble into these fibrils and potentially trapping other proteins and making these aggregates and then forming this Lewy body, which is, I guess, the hallmark of Parkinson's diseases. Do we do we know where the alpha synuclein comes from in Parkinson's? Because it, it, it's upregulated, right, during Parkinson's disease? Yes, I guess, um, I guess the... 
uh, at least from what I know, is the link for uh, of alpha cell nuclein into Parkinson is that um, they look at um, familial mutations. So there's some mutation like um, in, in certain part of the protein where I guess uh, in those individuals, they were more prone to develop Parkinson diseases. At the same time, they also um, look, I think it's from a genome wide screen where they um, looked at individual with Parkinson, they saw duplications, even triplication of these genes. So basically, the more of these genes, having more of this protein makes it express higher and you know, more chance of developing the, the diseases. That's that's how the, the trend got picked up and how it's related. Emma looked like she was going to jump in there. I was, but then you said what I was going to say. <laughs> just, <laughs> I was just nodding along. <laughs> we're, in the, we're in the rare situation where we have two experts on the topic today. That's great. great. <laughs> I, I like, I like, uh, I love... Uh, criticism. I mean, I don't know everything. And in fact, I'm, I'm very open to, if I, if I say anything wrong, I'm, I'm going to take it. I don't take any word. I'm, I'm very open. So I don't believe I know everything and I'm happy to learn things along the way. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, if you were thinking about where it's come from, as we were talking before, like kind of off air, we were mm -hmm. talking about the, the gut brain axis. And actually the thought is actually alpha synuclein can move in a prion like fashion from enteric neurons in the gut up to the brain. So that's kind of, it's thought to predate the motor symptoms by about 10 years ish. That, that's right. So uh, yeah, I guess that's the thing I failed to share in the introduction. So when this environmental trigger happens, so you get this, I guess, this pathogenic form of alpha synuclein, right? So they, they kind of now, they become the template, right? So they kind of speed things up by, by being the seed. And I guess that alludes a bit to my papers. They become the seed and they kind of make the recruitment of other, I guess, physiologically normal, uh, normally folded functional alpha synuclein to come with them. And they kind of, they propagate just much like the Macau disease, I guess, as an example. So by having this seed, I guess, as Emma mentioned, so we don't know where these seeds start. And some people say start in the guts, that means your intestine. And then basically it crosses uh, somehow into the spinal cord, which is where most patients are. Uh, so so to, to look at, to diagnosis is what they do. They look at the cerebral spinal fluid. So I guess I'm looking for the seeds in there. So that's how um, some of the classic assays are working at the moment. And then somehow it reaches the brain. So it travels up the spinal cord from the gut. I mean, it could easily reach the brain and just cross the blood brain barrier. So that's, yeah, I mean, I don't know that much of the mechanism, but that's that's what has been proposed for sure. That's, that's one of the things I find really interesting about Parkinson's is it is you can relate it to prion diseases, which themselves are super interesting, totally off topic. So I'm going to throw my knowledge in the, the arena here because we had a nice discussion about all of this before we started recording and I felt very left out. So generally speaking, in all, you know, all diseases, all disorders, there is an underlying immune dysfunction component usually inflammation uh, and that has a I know it's got a role in Parkinson's disease but I'm not super I mean it's not my area I'm not super familiar with it but do you know what is going on with the immune system here because with these the, you know you, you mentioned these Lewy bodies and the, this buildup of things that aren't meant to be there the immune system is going to come along and try and clear those and that exacerbates problems I to be honest as much as uh, I, I'm not a trained immunologist so I don't want to say the wrong thing I at the moment I haven't came up with any I um, could be wrong, right? So I didn't came up anything involving T cell, memory T cell, whatnot. But there's definitely a lot of antibody works, actually, if, I, if it's relevant. Um, lots of biopharma company like looking for antibodies that target disease, right? So just bind it and neutralize it. Uh, I guess if your question was whether there's specific, I guess, uh, leukocytes that are engineered to to look for them, I, I, I'm not sure for that, to be honest. I wouldn't be able to answer that for sure. Certainly, I could imagine having you know, all your macrophages swarming up your brain looking for this, I guess, bad poison, if you would say, dopaminergic neurons. So I, I can't imagine how much inflammation that will cause and I guess the effect could be bad. But just throwing out there, I mean, I, I don't know much about that per se. I, I, I just thought I'd throw the immunology span. Yeah, there, of course, of so. course. But there's definitely um, a lot of companies working in, you know, um, small compounds, small peptides, um, you are looking to, I guess, inhibit the propagation process. And yeah, antibodies uh, has been, I guess, as close as immunology I could associate with, probably the, the closest I can think of um, in that aspect. So from my um, limited knowledge as well on the immunology-based side of Parkinson's disease, maybe I'll go look it up a bit more after this, but it, the, one of the main causes is neuroinflammation generally. But that's just kind of like a toxic environment, right, mm. from all the 
I guess the glial cells and the vitaglia and all of those mm -hmm. uh, immune response. But that's basically as much as I've really known. I know it's the main cause. I just don't know the underlying cellular basis for it. <laughs> yes, it's it's a tr it's a tricky yeah it's a tricky environment of course. So yeah. So before I get back to the the questions about the preprint, I've got another general question. Um, so you, you've mentioned the fact that there's a potential link to your microbiota in your gut, which is one of those again, it's one of those emerging fields which is seemingly involved in everything and is super interesting that I don't know all that much about. Mm -hmm. But what what do we know in terms of you know is this one of those well very sort of Daily Mail journalist hat on here? Can we just eat some nice probiotic yogurts and cure ourselves? Mm. I, I just, yeah, I just don't want to be in a position to, to say something that's not true. I, I don't know much about microbiota per se. Um, but the, I guess, I guess the only relevant I can think, like, I know about why Parkinson could originate from, like, the gut is, I guess, the symptoms associated with constipation. So I guess because the motor neurons are obviously not functioning properly. So they, they have difficulty, you know, passing the, the food in your stomach so that's how they kind of alluded to that so microbiota I, i'm not so sure if it's i don't know if yogurt would would, would help solve that issue so I, i'll ask i'll ask i'll ask it a bit more more seriously um yeah, yeah okay so some of the some of the microbiota studies have amazingly managed to say you know show that if you have a certain composition of gut bacteria then that can be either beneficial or, or damaging i mean these are super complex studies and it's obviously never going to be that simple in reality but has anyone done that do you know for parkinson's disease or any neuro disease actually i'm not sure not that i've read yeah. sorry not not that i've read so i wouldn't 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 want to give wrong advice per se i just did a quick uh google on this just to make sure i wasn't misquoting anything <laughs> and there's a study that's just been done and i'll link it in the podcast notes or the show notes but basically they're saying that they did several studies analyzed the gut microbiome and pd patients pd patients but there wasn't like a consensus on the features of a mm. pd specific microbiota that is like missing i'll link i'll link it in the paper is that the one is that the one i'm reading also is that um by nature uh publishing group parkinson disease yeah it's 10th of march yeah yes uh, i think i'm yes yes i'm reading the very same one yeah it's interesting for sure. I mean, microbiota is so huge, right? Like it's it's a big field in itself. Like there's so much, so many different bugs that are healthy uh, for you. So it's it'll be you need to do quite a bit of work to just dissect which ones can help, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's not easy. Well, there you go. There you go. Live reporting just there. <laughs> Aren't we professional? <laughs> <laughs> um, so back to the preprint, let's get back on track, I guess. So, so you've been looking at alpha-synuclein and you've been doing some single molecule profiling. So this is not something that I've come across very often. So could you explain what single molecule profiling is and how uh, you yeah, went about course. it? So um, I guess this um, stems from my work in PhD. I'm very interested in, in fact, I've always been interested in doing microscopy. Um, and uh, I guess coming stemming from my uh, one of my PhD chapters, so where I basically um, used the very same technique to uh, look at protein-protein interaction uh, with um, with HIV, um, the capsid, which is a shell. So uh, that technique is called uh, single molecule spectroscopy. And what single molecule means, you you can actually look at, a, I guess, a, a reaction and interaction, but like down to the very single molecule level. And that, and that you can do so, and that is in contrast to bulk reading. So what you call bulk reading, for example, a plate reader. So when you read a fluorescence or something that's in bulk, so it's the whole solution, but average, right? Um, where the single molecule, you kind of have a bit more, uh, the best way is granularity, right? So you can go a bit closer, like you, you shrink that volume down to a very, very small volume. And that can be achieved because, you know, the, 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 the lens can focus to one point, right? And that point is known as the, the confocal volume. So when it, fit, it fit focuses at that point until it can't focus anymore, you still have a very small volume there, which is approximately one femtoliters, I believe. So when, when molecule crosses in that, in that confocal volume, and if it has the right fluorophore, and your, I guess your microscope, your confocal, is not now operating in confocal mode, has the right uh, laser that's compatible with the fluorophore, so it emits light, and that is captured. So essentially, you're able now to to resolve small things in solution that you otherwise cannot see in bulk. That's essentially, I guess, in, in a nutshell, if I put it that way. So it's, it, it's a bit like uh, RNA-seq v single cell RNA-seq then, I guess. Something like that. I guess like looking at, I don't know, I guess you guys are all uh, know, you know more than me, I guess, flow cytometry. I guess instead of looking at the entire... <laughs> 
<laughs> do you, Emma? I don't know. Do you guys use that technique? Emma often? likes it, but Emma doesn't, do, Emma doesn't do real I do like cytometry. I, cytometry. I do in. a very a base. I just look for like GFP tag proteins and don't do massive sets of like different antibodies and have to kind of work it all out. I just kind of go, we see expression of GFP. We don't. <laughs> but, but let's imagine for a second. So you can either have a readout for your, your plate of culture dish or you can just sort the cells out and that's the sorting kind of like gives more granularity mm. right so this is this is i like guess single cell approach single molecule approach yeah. kind of equivalent i thought to put into perspective so i guess one of the big benefits of that is that you can kind of detect heterogeneity more right you can detect correct quite granular differences between and you're doing this on the it's not the cell level it's the, it's the molecule level yes that's right well I, I, yeah molecule level I, I aggregate level at the moment yeah. so yeah so is that something that can in the you know the context of what what you're doing can that lead to earlier detection of parkinson's disease yes so emma earlier mentioned that uh, i guess with um people i guess the i guess the i would say well, not limitation but i guess the the problem what we see at like for diagnosis of Parkinson's is usually when the person is you know diagnosed which is already quite a difficult thing because so much symptoms overlap with other illnesses um it would be quite I guess late in the progression and difficult to reverse I mean you could put them on treatment like to slow it down but it'll be I guess quite late so I guess having this tool in hand that um, I guess our lab has have developed will enable us to you know see things you know with with uh, much smaller I guess concentration because we have this now high sensitivity so we were hoping yeah we could be used to you know for early detection because as soon as you have very little quantity you're able to say yep that person has it whereas in bulk you most likely won't be able to see it until you know very late stage so this is I mean you, you mentioned you know you're, you're looking at this down a microscope obviously we can't benefits of mice versus humans here uh, with a human, you can't just put a microscope on their brain and have a look at them. Uh, they won't like that very much. So you know, in your introduction to the paper, you mentioned two techniques that can detect alpha-synuclein in biofluids. So is this, I guess this is ultimately where you're kind of working towards, right? You you want to be able to take a sample from a patient and then detect these kind of things. That, that's correct. So we are, we are working uh, towards that. And um, my uh, supervisors, so uh, Dr. Jan Gambin and Dr. Emma Sareki, uh, are I think they probably have been cooking something in the background. Submit, I, I wasn't sure, but they, we're definitely moving towards that direction. And I, I guess that is what always keeps me excited, actually, like having, you know, be able, I get the privilege to, to you know, touch clinical sample is always a, a, something new to me. I haven't tried, especially I've always been working, you know, recombinant protein in, in my candidature so far. So having access to clinical sample, I think it's, it's a great privilege. For sure, we are working towards that. And that would be great, actually, because as I mentioned before, like the only way to diagnose Parkinson's disease, or at least what I can see, even it's not FDA approved yet, but you've got this bulk assay. So and I say bulk because that's what it is. And um, to detect them, you, you kind of use CSF, which I mentioned is, is the cerebral spinal fluid that you get from lumbar spine. And to get that is actually quite, I would say, in my perspective, quite invasive. And of course, for longitudinal studies to, you know, to look at progressions of the disease or even see if the drug works, you wouldn't want to be shoving needles every once or so often. And, you know, especially not something which is quite sterile and aseptic, right, in your spine. So, yeah, definitely a test or to, you know, look at validation on other bowel fluid like blood, saliva, things like that, or urine, for example, would be would greatly, greatly make, um, yeah, would make it make more sense, I would say. Have you seen any papers that have looked at blood, like successfully looked at alpha synuclein blood? Uh, there was one that was, it should, I should have read it, but I haven't yet. They, they did look at, I think, urine, I believe, but I just haven't read in detail. No, that's yet. Right. It was just my opinion. We all have a long, <laughs> long pile yes, of papers. We have, a long, we have a long list, and, you know, there's always, and I'm sure my supervisor would say, you know, shouldn't you be doing all the reading in the lockdown? <laughs> which is what is happening in Sydney yeah, at the yeah. moment. So I always find other, I guess, uh, constructive procrastination. Yeah. I'm sure they okay. don't want me saying that. They're going to be listening for sure. It's, it's okay. Yeah. We all do <laughs> it. I think it is a vital part of getting through the day sometimes. Yes, yes. I guess that's all part of the uh, research experience, right? You just see something interesting and you just follow that. I, we, we have a friend who he basically works 11 till like 4. Um, oh my goodness. I don't think he listens very often, so I'm okay saying mm -hmm. all this about him. And if he does, uh, I don't care. Um, so, so, and yeah, he, he very much believes in having regular coffee breaks and has been known to have multiple hour-long coffee breaks a day. 
I'm not entirely sure how he does any work. But he does well. But he has just submitted a paper and it's really cool. So, so you know, clearly he does do work mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, I mean, I, I, maybe he's just uh, very talented. And just... Oh, don't say that. He, his, ego, <laughs> his ego does not need to be made any bigger. you got to give him props. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Nah, we don't. <laughs> I think that, that might be, could be natural talent. <laughs> So in this preprint, you, you, you've designed a 3D printed attachment called Atobrite. Um, so I'm going to come back to just 3, 3, 3D sort of deep printing stuff in general. But could you tell us a little bit about Atobrite, sort of what it is, what it does? Oh, sure. Um, I, I actually wasn't the one, I guess, that brought it to life, if I should say. So it was actually our, our former postdoc uh, working in the same group, actually that um, worked together with, I guess, a senior RA. Uh, his name is uh, Dr. James Brown, actually, Mr. Akshay Bamkar. So they are the one uh, that actually published the design um, in um, Nature Communication, I believe. So, And I guess if I was to, I guess, give a bit more of a description on what the machine is, it's a very, very small portable device. So um, the I guess the objective there was to make this this technique, single molecule spectroscopy, more accessible to others. So we kind of, uh, at least my supervisors was also the idea as well, is to make it like, you know, printable. So with 3D printing becoming more accessible these days and more affordable. Uh, so we could just print these and build this microscope with just the you know the basic components so we just have like a laser which is compatible with your fluorophore like if you want just single color detection of your fluorophore you just have one um avalanche shorter diodes so that's like a, like a detector to, to capture the light emitted and you have a few cleanup mirrors and there you go and it's very portable it's like I don't know what size does it look at. It's it's a very small device. I, we we have a photo for the figure there, but it's it's as small as a PC tower that you buy from Dell. So it's a very small thing. Um, you just plug in and just calibrate it, and there you go. And I guess one of the mission for having I guess a 3D printed devices, or like I said, so accessibility was one. But we also wanted to design it to be friendly for analysis, so to able to be used in other labs without you know too much expertise. And the, I guess the background is um, for those kind of system, like real, real, like hardcore, real, like confocal micro system, they have to be, you know, like very expensive uh, maintenance and other things. And you also need like specialist offices to maintain them, right? So we want to kind of remove all this agency and just, you know, keep it nice, essential and simple. Uh, and is, so, you know, with it being 3D print, is this available to download online? Is the design? Oh, uh, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. I, I think the, I think everything is, is all uh, open. I guess it's open access in the nature com. Uh, happy to share the article but just look for james uh, brown but yeah, essentially you should be able to find it really easily yeah, it's 2019 so it was two years ago have a read if you guys are 3d printed autocad people i'm, I'm sure you you're able to open the file you should be able to just print it really quickly and build your own just reminds me actually because i was just listening to one of preprints motion podcast um very similar i guess the logic of the um uh, lego microscope mm. which is i believe is your first episode it was our first episode yes yes so i think I, I think i guess our vision is more like towards that person so scientists we're working with so i do like that i mean obviously you know 3d printing it's not a new thing anymore but it's becoming more normal and it's becoming cheap enough that you know as a lab you, you can buy a 3d printer i mean certainly in america there's a few cases i know where labs have their own 3d printer and they'll do things like um they'll print test tube racks up and stuff because they cost so i don't know if i don't know if anyone listening or on this call has ever ordered test tube racks they're expensive oh they're very expensive they're very expensive every every everything that slaps with thermal fisher merc oh the premium just goes up by 200 percent. yeah it's ridiculous i, I don't um... this is magical <laughs> This is the magic of marketing and branding, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, you know, like making these things is just so much cheaper. And I, I think every university should do that because you save so much money. I, I think so too. I, I totally think so too. So it is, it is really nice that this is our second time where we're actually talking to somebody who's, who's actually actively doing something like this. It's really good. Thank you. So I can skip my next question. We've already asked it. So, um, alpha synuclein, you, you mentioned that this can aggregate and when it does this, this essentially forms sort of a fingerprint, and you can use that to identify the subspecies of uh, alpha synuclein. Why is it important to identify the subspecies? Do the different species of alpha synuclein have sort of worse pathologies? So I guess this is where we're trying to kind of delineate. I guess most of the model would always say you have the monomer, then you have kind of make into these oligomers, and, and these oligomers are quite pleomorphic, right? There's different shape, there's different reactivity, from mutation gets more complicated, but then or from the ligaments you get these short fibrils, 
and then it rearrange to more beta sheet and then eventually you're not getting to very long filaments so we want to examine you know like which one of are these oligomers like no one has from our knowledge has seen that oligomers are even though they're the intermediates like are they are they all you know seeding competent like can they grow can they all act the same and i guess this is where we bring our sensitivity right we're able to you know sort the, not only see them but we're able to kind of sort them and we can kind of so i guess first part of the figure is we're able to you know track them as they they grow over a period of five hours, which in the scope of things, you know, I mean, a lot of experiments kind of make fireball, they, they kind of shake them for days. And we're just looking at the first five hours, right? I bet we're doing very high concentration, which is quite standard, you know, what has been done. But we, we look in the first five hours, and we're already seeing, you know, a, a tons of heterogeneity. So we've got fibrils, we've got short filaments, uh, very, you know, round oligomers, a bit of everything. So that's why I guess the next follow up, we want to, you know, separate them and just look at them individually and compare them essentially. And I guess the scientific question is more, you know, can we use this now, this, we have this profile, once we sort them, we look at this profile, can we now allocate them? Okay, if, if a person kind of have this bar fluid and we see this pattern, is he at the risk of the early stage of Parkinson's disease or not? Mm. So could that be an important fingerprint? So that's where we're kind of heading towards, I guess. And this, so, you know, the, the method you've got working now and you've developed, is this something you can use to look at other aggregates in Parkinson's disease? Because alpha synuclein is not, not the only one. At, at the moment, not really. We 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 just have the, the construct. And since I just, I guess I started my postdoc a, a little bit, I would say maybe a year, a little bit over a year. So in that field, I haven't got the chance to touch other things yet. Mm. Definitely there has been occasion where collaborators has been sending us um, tau for repeats. So I guess that one's for Alzheimer's disease. So we had a bit of playing with those, but obviously my, my hands are full on that assay. So didn't really touch that one. I mean, there's a lot of interesting things to explore, like crosstalk and like could that see the other? I mean, comorbidity of Alzheimer's and Parkinson. I mean, so much to explore. But so little time, as always. <laughs> so I haven't yet, but um, certainly uh, there'll be, I'm sure, maybe down the line. And so, what about sort of adapting this to larger scale? Because you know, ultimately, we want to detect Parkinson's earlier. We, you know, um, and this is one potential way of doing that. So, how how adaptable is it to sort of high throughput? I would say it's pretty high throughput. So in terms of timing, we read a sample. Uh, one sample can be read every 10 minutes. So I run six traces of 100 seconds, that's 600 seconds, 10 minutes. So I guess in one hour, you could run six. In two, three hours, you could run 18. So you run 18 a day, I would say. Negative plus positive. Yeah, I would say probably can run... 18, 20 sample a day comfortably, I would say. And then if you want to stay for longer, you should certainly run more and just do in tandem and just kind of like shift it. You can certainly, I mean, it's pretty easy Um, on the, I guess the longest from, I guess the bottleneck is usually the acquisition because it's like 10 minutes. The analysis is really automated. So we already have a script that is already developed by our, uh, it's a French intern that came to our lab. Chloe Magnon. So she actually um, yeah, developed the script and from Python against open source. And what that does, it goes in now, traces and just get all the parameters, the single molecule parameters, and then you can just quickly plot them. And all that's done you know, in an automated, very objective manner. So the analysis is quite fast, I wouldn't say slow. Mm -hmm. And then you can leave more time for interpretation that yeah. way but yeah the nice is really fast and easy to use friendly as well and there is an excellent plug for every lab having a coder they are incredibly beneficial and hugely underestimated yeah i tried learning coding but i guess i just it's a different language and just easily switched off and not c plus plus you got so many different languages yeah. it's difficult i um so i learned r just mm -hmm. before the first lockdown well started learning before the first lockdown and was very lucky to then get involved in a project where we had some like r experts who i just constantly bother with questions every time i do something because i always forget what because you don't use it like constantly i'm co i never remember how to do basic things so yes. they're always helping me out i i, I feel like yeah, definitely under, understand your, I guess, your feeling. Like, usually, like, you always, you want to learn something. And as soon as you don't practice it, you kind of forget. Yeah. I think it goes with any techniques, right? So, yeah. like, and, and, and that's, yeah, you, you really use it all the time. You can quite easily forget. There are always going to be, you know, easy ways. Like you say, ask some colleague, hey, can you help me here? And they're, they're always, like, nice chaps and just give you a hand. Just a stone throw away. <laughs> 
So Emma, have you got any more sciencey questions to ask? No, I think um, you answer you because I wrote the questions. I think you've asked everything that I was interested in. I think I stuck to them all. Yeah, <laughs> well done, Johnny. <laughs> I mean, I still went off topic and threw my own in there, but I think I actually this might be the first time I've asked every question Emma's written. <laughs> I try. I really do try. <laughs> I think I think you're doing fantastic. <laughs> so we'll keep that bit in. Where do I find out about the different bioarchived licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. ASAP Bio have a resource for that. Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. So, I mean, you mentioned that you, you're, you're a relatively new postdoc. You're just over a year. I'm also just over a year into technically my second postdoc, but we don't talk about the first one because uh, I'd probably get into trouble if I did. So, you know, how are you finding being a postdoc? Particularly because, uh, you know, as you mentioned, you are in lockdown at the moment and Australia has been quite tough on the lockdown. So have you managed to get into the lab a lot? Yeah, it has. Uh, the answer is no. We pretty much uh, reduced to very few people. Uh, I believe our deans uh, took, I guess, the lockdown restriction quite seriously. And for good reason. Mm. I think it just protects our community, just keep everybody safe until our state ramps up with the vaccination rate, which is going very promising so at the moment i wasn't able to gain the access so most of the time like i say read um the the, the preprint fact, but the reviewer came back with the comments and i was just i guess before this i was just working with the rebuttal and how to how to uh explain and and clarify a few issues there so working on that doing some readings here and there just try to keep busy from that time yeah so that's what i've been doing lately so how have you found being a postdoc compared to being a phd student Admittedly, it's going to be a bit weird with lockdown, but... Yeah, so I definitely feel it's kind of similar. Definitely, you get more freedom to work on a project. The, the supervisor has more, I guess, faith. You're more autonomous. You try to keep yourself motivated, and it's it's a, it's, it's kind of similar, but then you've got a bit more advanced intellectual, which is which is what you get after graduating, mm -hmm. right? So, so more hands-off kind of thing and then you just have to deliver and just push yourself to to deliver you know deadline that you set yourself i think that's that's it that's the difference and yeah i think that that's that's the only difference i can see are you enjoying being a post i i am i am at the moment because i got so much to look forward to so like i guess the work at the moment it's just lockdown is really not helping yeah. and I, you can't really blame anybody per se uh i definitely i i'm looking forward to to i guess that like i mentioned previously uh the clinical translation aspects so being able to touch clinical sample and um, i i think this would help me i guess even if i ever decide to transition to industry because i mean clinical knowledge is always good like i've been looking at roles like medical science liaison that uses that kind of skill right so i guess having some clinical uh, knowledge could be helpful if i ever decide to go there just keep yourself you know open for that Another thing I was looking forward to is, um, since I'm, like I say, I'm a big fan of microscopy, I, I, I'm really looking forward to do some cryo transmission electron microscopy. And yeah, and where, where I'm working, where I have this fantastic trainer, um, Dr. Nicholas Ariotti. Um, he's fantastic. Um, he's been teaching me a lot of stuff. So definitely waiting for that opportunity just to make it, you know, scientifically sound to start to learn that technique. So just waiting for that. A lot to look forward to. 
So our, our friend I mentioned earlier did some uh, electromicroscopy stuff, and he really he loved it. And actually, as a group, we, we quite like our microscopes. That's, uh, <laughs> that's Sheffield for you. It's, uh, it instills yes. microscopes. Uh, I still, so I, I mean, my, my whole project is, is heavily microscopy based, and it's, it's so much fun. Is it cells? I guess it's like microsectioning and things so, like that. So, right? um, I'm some of it is looking at cells, the more sort of traditional confocal stuff, but we also do a lot of IVM, so uh, in in vitro st- uh, intravital microscopy. Right, right, right. Those ones just <sighs> can't remember what I do <laughs> these days. So we do a lot of intravital microscopy. So, and that is that's something I like. I've wanted to learn for years. It's really cool. That's like looking in the mouse, right? Like you, you kind of you have the mouse kind of yeah. So we, we you... um. Yep. So you, you knock your mouse out and we what we do is we look at how immune cells cross uh, through like veins and arteries and stuff. So basically you, you put you put your mouse in the microscope um, and you've got an exposed muscle in this case and you can just see the blood flow. And it's, it, that alone is super cool to sit and watch. I could sit and watch that for yeah. hours. It's, I love it. I, I can understand. That's why I, I, I want to just say this like... I, I kind of more in the camp like seeing is believing. Yeah. So having to see through a lens like with your eyes and I guess being the first one kind of gives it the joy of being a researcher, right? You're the first one to see things. So it's yeah. really cool. And there's things you just, you, you can't ever do unless you look at it and see it or things you would mm-hmm. never think of unless you see it. There's some, I mean, some really cool examples where that's happened. So you know, what, what, one of the other transitions you, you'll have done is that you went from HIV to Parkinson's disease. So you've kind of crossed from immunology to neurology. And as we were talking about off off mic, cool, proper technical term there for you all, I assume. You know, those two fields are traditionally sort of the most complex in, in the biosciences. So, I mean, why, I guess, is the question. Why would you do that to yourself? Um, I, just for out of interest, I, I knew... I knew, I guess, coming out of PhD and from my um, supervisor, who, who has been a lovely mentor to me, so uh, Associate Professor Tilbocking, kind of gave me kind of advice like, once I graduated. He said, look, doing a postdoc, you, you would usually want to, like, either you maintain a bit of your technique and learn something totally new to inspire yourself, or you stay in the same field, but kind of learn new techniques. So it's either one way or the other. So I guess when, when I graduated with the COVID, I was kind of looking more a job locally. So I mean, just to went to, I mean, did consider US. In fact, I had, I had a fantastic professor from, from the US that kind of offered me a job, but uh, I had to decline politely. So just because various personal issues, but of course, like the COVID being one of the reasons. And uh, I just wanted to wear it die down. So picked up this application with, you know, with my current supervisors and same technique, different fields, that's it. Why not explore something new? And, and you know, I got that clinical side, which I'm wetting my appetite. So I definitely want to explore that. I mean, that's that's actually probably really good advice to to PhD students. to Because I've never thought of it like that, but it is, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, he's fabulous. So yeah, my supervisor is really supporting. I just can't thank him enough for that. And, and you know, one of the things most of us don't get to do is come anywhere near clinical samples. You know, most of our research, we're kind of stuck on, to be honest, topics that are quite esoteric. You know, it's sometimes hard to explain why what you're doing is important to, to the general public, because why would people care if you're looking at something that doesn't have any clinical relevance, which, of course, there's always really good reasons for doing this. But so I guess you, you mentioned a few times now that, that it's kind of one of those things that is something that's really good to look forward to. It's, I mean, that must was that one of the big reasons you wanted to, to start on this kind of thing? One of the big reasons for sure. I mean, also the other thing, I guess, like option obviously to go to industry. And at that time I, I looked, I mean, Australia, again, like I said, Australia is not very big on in terms of the, the job market. I, at least that's how I felt. And in the US, definitely a lot of the application would ask for like, I don't know, two, three, four years of mm-hmm. industry experience. And just coming out, I didn't really feel that confident. Let's be honest. So like I would be pitched against the same guys in the States that has accumulated mountains more experience than me. So I say one or two year postdoc and see if something I like and I find something I like, keep going and see how far I I can go. That is also a good outlook. A lot of people kind of fix themselves on, I want my own lab and I'm doing everything I can to get to it. And then they kind of realize how difficult and awful that can can sometimes be. And then kind of they they don't seem to know what else to do. So it's, I think it's really good to have quite an open attitude when you're certainly at the start of scientific careers. I, I, there's, there's a quote that I, was, I wasn't I was taught, but it was in high school. And my math, math teacher, his name was Mr. Box, actually. Um, he's pretty, he's really fun to be with. And he has on this wall, uh, plastic wall, he said, it's written, 
if you try, you may fail, but if you don't try, you are guaranteed to fail. So since I've we've given opportunities, you know, just take it and, and give it a go, give it your best and see where it leads you. Okay. Keep the doors open. Oh, that would be a good place to end, but I have more questions. <laughs> um, oh, we can always take it offline, but yeah, <laughs> so, so good. <laughs> whose decision was to preprint this work? Is this, you know, is this something you've thought about a lot or was this a, a supervisor's decision? So it's, uh, I would say supervisor's decision uh, for sure, but I have sent to preprint uh, during my PhD candidate chart, so I'm not entirely new at this process, mm. I guess. It's actually not a bioarchive because it was the same platform that I submitted my I think it was my first 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 author paper so that was put in my archive and i think it's really interesting that moment and i didn't know about that kind of i guess service publishing I guess, aspect in academia until you know when i put it up there and certainly i to be honest i felt a bit uneasy not because it wasn't right i mean it's out there i mean you have like a lot of i guess colleagues saying or oh, you could be scooped and i think that you covered a bit in some mm. previous episode about why preprint right so there's what that aspect and there's also like okay so you have this preprint sitting there is it scientifically reviewed validated i mean anyone can just post anything especially in the current covid period you know you get these predatory anti-vaxxers or whatever they can always be opportunistic and take whatever you publish Take, for example, the is that the malaria drug that, that was controversial. So yeah. things like that. So it always opens, you know, kind of risk and benefit, right? So I, I'm a bit of a mixed bag. But for sure, like for this one, that um, for this single molecule paper, now for something it was my supervisor that, that uploaded. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're hitting on topics there that I know quite a lot about because <laughs> um, we've, look, we've, we've looked at it. But I'm not going to keep plugging my own work because I feel like I do that way too much on here. Nobody <laughs> needs to hear any more about my COVID work. I'm sure you've all read the papers and couldn't care less anymore by now. Um, but th so I feel like I ask this question every episode, but it's I ask it because it's really interesting to sort of get people's opinions on why they've done it and what their experience is with it. Um, one of my fantastic co-authors, Nick Fraser, he recently posted a preprint that, I mean, I'm sure it'll come out as a paper soon, uh, where they did a survey of bioarchive authors to find out sort of their, their reasonings for, for posting preprint and stuff. And actually, a, a lot of what you've said fits quite quite nicely into what, what they found. And it, it's I always find it interesting that is often, with at least with the people we've spoken to, it's usually the supervisor's decision to do it, which is surprising because, the, again, I, I keep saying this like every episode, I'm sure everyone's sick of hearing it, but one of the best things about preprint is that it benefits us more than anyone else. You know, it's the early researchers are the ones who really gain from preprinting the work. And I'm, I'm always surprised by how it's not us pushing that as much as I, I expect it to be. I guess in hindsight, I would say definitely it's good to have a conversation with mm. your supervisor, manager. So I guess you give a bit of that respect. Uh, that's just how I feel, right? So give him that respect because it's his work, it's his idea it was his conceptualization so you kind of want to respect him and say hey boss like are you okay to put that on there if he wants great if he doesn't maybe give some room to understand like okay that could be a very risky project we want to shoot high and just keep it low for a little bit and i mean i would take that as a valid reason and then i mean i just i guess after hearing that reasoning i guess it would be okay to let go but definitely having that conversation would, would be quite helpful and and you can also like you say um you, you explain oh it would be good for my career like to to see you know what i have done if i'm moving to another lab for example it would be great to have that and i'm sure great supervisors out there if you if they're ever listening they would understand that you know what's good for you know his or her employees i will have to assume like also be good for them right yeah, yeah in the long run so it's good to have that conversation it is it is sure. and it's it's you know it's i think it's good to bring your point across that it is beneficial for you, it's beneficial for the lab, and I think that is a really important point. Mm. And I think that's another good point to end, actually. That seems like a nice ending point. I've got no more <laughs> questions. I'm out of questions. <laughs> no, that seems like... Anything else? Uh, no, do you want to plug the nature thing again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I see I'd forgotten. So, <laughs> sorry, John, more editing. So for anyone who hasn't come across this yet, although if you're active on Twitter, it's probably very difficult to have not come across this yet, uh, Nature News published a series, I think it was four articles, a couple of days ago. And they followed two amazing scientists who started their labs up in Sheffield University in the UK. Yeah, I saw that. 
the PIs now, yeah. So it was Dan Bolson, and Ali Twelve Trees. Um, so I mean, I they started as I was leaving Sheffield. So I did. I met Dan a couple of times, and I've chatted to Ali a little bit on on Twitter. Yeah, I worked with Ali a bit. I worked with Ali. Yeah, but they're lovely. Um, but basically, it's, it's tracking their journey as new PIs as they sort of start their labs and the difficulties of starting a lab. I, it's a very brutally honest piece. Um, Dan and Ali are very, very honest in it, which is unfortunately rare, I think, in academia. Not everyone is willing to be so upfront about the, the real experience. But it's just a really, really good piece of reporting. It, it's quite a gripping read. There's twists in there you don't see coming. So if, if anyone has not seen that, go go and read it. It'll be in the show notes because Emma's now going to have to dig it out. I'm looking now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i'm definitely gonna read it so please share so it is it is an it is re- just an excellent piece and uh, yeah everyone should read it and it is it's generated a huge amount of discussion on twitter about the the academic career structure and how awful it is and how we really really need to reform the system as it is um and oh who was it i can't remember who it was somebody on twitter is now start starting up a i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to look for it somebody on twitter has started up a working group to sort of investigate this and try and get across these things to the funding bodies. So I've just opened Twitter and it's the first thing that pops on Twitter. There you go. Oh, I'll find it later. But yeah, there you go. There was the plug. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much for, for coming on. That was I, that was a really interesting yeah, discussion. Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Emma, for having me. It was a great privilege. Yeah, it was lovely to have you. I really, really enjoyed having you on. I mean, I guess that's because it's kind of relate to what I do as well so I'm just quite keen to, <laughs> to yeah it's, it's good to have it's good to have conversations with um yeah like-minded and sure it's a very rare opportunity yeah. especially in this lockdown yeah. very very good thank you very much thank, thank you. you okay and that is the show if you enjoyed listening then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on you can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsinmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week. <laughs>